Thank you for that introduction, Ron, because that's what we're talking about this morning. We're going to draw from the question and we're going to ask the question, how does God introduce himself to us? And God introduces himself to us in many ways, but I'd like to target the main way, his most preferred way. We're going to, to help us out with this question, we're also going to ask another question. How does God introduce himself to Moses? And I'm going to draw from the burning bush because that's where I'm saying God introduced himself to Moses. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, hang on a minute, Moses is 80 years old at this point. He knows God, doesn't he? He knows God. And I would say, yeah, yes, you're right. But this is how I would say it. Moses knows of God. Moses knows about God. In fact, quite a lot about God. Moses has heard about God, but Moses does not know God personally. And I say that with a little bit of confidence because later on, after the event of the burning bush, Moses is at Mount Sinai and he's having this conversation with God. And in that conversation, he says to God, show me your ways so that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight. Now, does that sound like the sort of thing that you would say if you already knew your God? Or does that sound like the sort of thing you would say if you were diligently seeking your father, seeking your God, and you desperately wanted to know him and you wanted to know him on a personal level? So how does God introduce himself? Yes, God's introduction. Before we get stuck in, I just want to highlight a scenario of life about how people introduce themselves. Because I think it highlights this introduction of God and Moses quite well and how God introduced himself to us. And so this is the scenario. Let's say you have a friend who has another friend who you have not met yet. I'll explain this diagram. See the circles and see where they, should I say bubbles to use more modern terminology? See where the bubbles overlap? That represents a personal relationship. So you will see that you have a personal relationship with your friend, but you also see that your friend has a personal relationship with both you and this other friend but you do not have a personal relationship with that friend. That's the scenario. And this is, this is how it plays out. You're hanging with your friend and it seems that your friend is constantly talking about this other friend, all about what they say and about what they do. And it goes on and on and on. Oh, I'll tell you what my friend does in this situation. And oh, you'll never believe what my friend would say. My friend says the funniest things. That sort of carry on. And it goes on and on and on. And you might get to the point where we'll say, well, when am I going to meet this friend? And they might say, you, you got to meet my friend. One question, however, about this. How good a job does your friend do at portraying this other friend? Do they portray them in such a way that you would actually want to meet them? Or are you kind of on the fence thinking, you know what, well, I could take it or leave it. I don't mind if I never meet this person. That's all good. So what happens when you do actually meet? And this is what we're talking about today, the meeting. What are you going to say? What's going to go down when you meet this mystery friend? I'll tell you what you're going to say. You're going to say, it's so good to meet you. I've heard so much about you. And you know what they're going to say? I hope it's all good. <laughs> you know the situation. I know whether you've been in it or whether you've heard about it. This is the situation that I believe highlights what's going on here uh, with God. What I want to do with the situation now is I want to put Moses and God into the situation and then we're going to fill it out. So I believe Moses fits there and I believe God fits there. Moses and God have not personally met yet. 
and they're meeting now at the burning bush. So a few questions come to mind. Who is that person that knows both Moses and God? Who has brought Moses to a knowledge of God? And therefore, how is God going to introduce himself? Is it not a good idea that God would connect himself with that friend, the first the person that Moses knows? I'd say that's a pretty good idea in this introduction. And so I'd just like to highlight something before we get further. In a normal situation, that friend is present in the introduction. This is, this is, this is the friend that stands there and goes, hey, my friend, meet my other friend, the one I've been telling you so much about. But in this case, the friend is not present. So it's a little bit different. And in normal circumstances, those two people, where Moses and God are, would probably walk past each other on the street because they don't actually know each other, unless there's been a lot of sharing of photos. But this is different because God is at play here. God is taking the lead. And Moses is the only one that doesn't know what's going on. And so how does God introduce himself? Well, he's going to connect himself with that person. Who is the person? Oh, okay. I didn't think I'd get answers. <laughs> Cheryl's not on the edge of her seat. She knows. <laughs> okay. Who is that friend? Well, I want to suspend you just a little, hold you back just a little bit longer because I want to go back to the burning bush and we're going to find out who this person is. And I want you on the edge of your seats. I've divided the first part of the burning bush into phases. And we get the answer at phase four of the burning bush meeting, right? And that's where we find out. So phase one is quite simple. God just appears to Moses in the form of a burning bush in the middle of the wilderness and Moses notices it. It just attracts his attention. I must draw near. It's phase two. As Moses draws near, the bush speaks to him. Moses, Moses. And Moses responds in the usual manner. Here am I. Moses doesn't know who's talking to him, by the way. A little bit confusing for him. The third phase, the bush speaks to him again, but this time it's a commandment. Take off your shoes because you are standing on holy ground and so Moses takes off his shoes. Phase four. Moses to this point doesn't know who's talking to him, but now he does because God's about to introduce himself. And how does God do it? With these words, I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And we know this has a big impact on Moses. And we know Moses now knows who's talking to him because of Moses' reaction. And what is it? He hides his face because he is too afraid to look upon God. Now he knows. And he's afraid. So, how does God introduce himself? God associates himself with people that also know Moses. That's important. God associates himself with not just any people, people that know Moses or Moses knows, and that people that have worked closely with God, people that have served God well, or people that have had a relationship with God. Now, God could have said, I am the God. I am God. I am the creator. I am Yahweh. He says that later. God knows that in saying that information, it doesn't give him, saying those titles, it doesn't actually give Moses the level of information that Moses is extracting from that statement. And Moses, God wouldn't say his title to Moses at that point because Moses doesn't know him personally. And I don't think God perhaps would have even given Moses his name at the burning bush because remember Moses asked for it. This is how God introduces himself. So what's happening here and what sort of information is, is this giving Moses? Well, he knows a lot about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And he also knows that God has worked very, very closely in their lives. And by default, Moses knows lots about God. This is the stuff like, hey, 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are your are your forefathers. If you're an Israelite and you're patriotic, these are your family. These are the very first Israelites, and God is saying, "I'm their God," which is which, in other words, He's saying, "I'm your God." But God, but there's more to it. Moses also knows that God rewarded these men for their faith. God blessed these men greatly. God made these men great. He gave. He actually made them rich. He made them quite powerful, quite prominent, respected men wherever they sojourned. And that was because of God. He also knew that these men carried the promises that all Israelites were heir to. This is a lot of information that can be extracted from these words that God is saying. And Moses is in this moment of realization and it's huge for him. And he's covering his face because he realizes who is talking to him. And he's thinking, if you are the God of these men, then you must be an amazing God. And I'm quite fearful right now. I'm fearful to be in your presence. Perhaps I wouldn't have drawn so close to you if I knew you were the God of the spirit in the burning bush. Who am I? He's thinking, remember how he says that later? Who am I that you're going to talk to me? Right. So how does God introduce himself? He connects himself with people that Moses also knows. Um, these men brought Moses to a knowledge of God. And you know what? They bring us to a knowledge of God. What we know of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are very, very powerful for us to learn about God. Abraham was his friend. Right? So we can learn a lot. How does God connect? How does God introduce himself? He connects himself with people. That's kind of similar to how we introduce ourselves to each other. Don't you think that's kind of humbling? Because God is the creator. Couldn't God use much more magnificent ways of introducing himself? He chooses to be connected to people. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're looking at this this diagram going, hey, where's something wrong? Moses doesn't have a personal relationship with Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, does he? Remember, they're, they're long past. So this is where my exhort was going to take a different turn, but I'm going to mention where I was heading. There is a missing link here. Who brought Moses to a knowledge of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And so I've been drawing from that part of the comment I am the God of your father. I've been thinking and exploring the possibility that God here is saying, I'm the God of your dad. But I'm not ready to deliver that yet. I've got what I think is compelling evidence. But there's also some questions. So I'm not going to say that. But having said that, I will say, whether God said I'm the God of your dad or not, who brought Moses to a knowledge of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And therefore, who brought Moses to the knowledge of God? It was his dad. And not just his dad, his mum. How important were Moses' parents in this connection about how God was able to introduce himself? Without that information that his father gave him, Moses would be none the wiser about who this God was. How important was Amram? Why am I going on and on about this God of your father? Well, this is a statement of inspiration for me right now. And God has been teaching me over the last year how to be a dad. And God has directed me to this statement by way of for, for, for me to extract inspiration. And God has caused me to think things like this. If God was going to introduce himself to my children our children, Mia, Hudson, and Lacey, could God say to them, I am the God of your father? I mean, that's huge, right? That is huge. How much do I want that to be the case? How much do I want to be that central figure or one of those central figures that have brought my children to a knowledge of God? And God can say, I'm the God of your dad. And that should tell them a lot. Now, I heard a talk recently, and the talk went like this. 
how do our children ever, ever get to know of the love of God? And the answer was, because they experience it through their parents. How much do I want to be able to give my children that experience? How much do I want to be that friend that continues to feed information to my children about God? You've got to meet God. He's amazing. God is this and God is that. And this is what God is like. And in so doing, I'm bringing them to God. And then God can introduce himself. They already know who God is in part until they take that step of knowing him personally. So because I couldn't draw from Amram just yet, because I'm still working on it, I wanted to find someone in the Bible who is a father that brings his son to God. And I wanted to find direct statements. And so I didn't have to look far. Maybe you could turn up Genesis 26. I'm back on Isaac again and Jacob and Abraham, but we've got direct statements. Genesis 26. What does it say? Uh, verse 23. God is speaking here to Isaac. And, I, and this is what God says. I am the God of your father, Abraham. Fear not. I am with you. I will bless you and I will multiply your offspring. That's a big statement for Isaac. And you know what Isaac could be thinking? Wow, if the God of Abraham, if the God of my dad is approaching me and saying to me that he's going to be with me, then I'm in really, really good hands. If the God... Yeah, and so why is that? Because Isaac knew his dad. He knew his dad so well, and he knew his dad had had a close relationship with God, and by implication, he was able to see the result of that relationship. He could see that Abraham was full of faith. He could see that Abraham was a great leader and a wonderful father. And so could Isaac be thinking regarding God if you are the God of my father, then you must be an amazing God and I want to get to know you. Let's have a look at Isaac's reaction. It's different to Moses' reaction. It's in verse 23. Do you know what Isaac does after God says this? He goes straight out, he builds an altar, makes a sacrifice, and he calls on the name of God. Do you know what Isaac wants? Isaac wants the God of Abraham to be his God. He wants to now move into the position. I should put this up here. He wants now to move into that central position that has where you have a relationship with God. And how he now needs, and then he wants to take that position to bring his next, his son to a knowledge of God. Was he successful? Was Isaac successful in making this relationship with God work and therefore bringing Jacob to a knowledge of God? I'm going to say yes, because we know when God introduces himself to Jacob. And in Genesis 28, God says to Jacob, I'm the God of your father. What a cool cycle that's happening here that repeats. And you know what? It happens again with Jacob. And we know it happens with Jacob because remember that statement that God always seems to repeat, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac. And right at the bottom and always right at the end, there is the God of Jacob too. Jacob achieved that as well. Coming into a knowledge of God, a personal relationship with him, and then being able to offer information to his children about who this God was. Okay, I just want to take a, a slightly different approach. I'm just about done. And I want to look at it from a slightly different angle. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking hypothetically, if that's the right word, I'm not even sure. But what I'm saying, 
if God was going to introduce himself to Jonathan, and when I say Jonathan, I mean Jonathan David, Jonathan, if God was going to introduce himself to Jonathan, could he say, I am the God of your father? Could he say like that, that comment? And you know what? I'm going to say no, because we know about Saul. Think about how Saul portrayed himself. Think about the anger and the jealousy and the depression and those murderous thoughts and the attempts on David's life. Think about the general depression of Saul and the darkness that seemed to follow him, the misfortune that followed Saul. That doesn't look like someone who had God in his life. Saul, I'm not saying God didn't want to be in Saul. I'm not saying God didn't want to be in Saul's life, but I'm saying that Saul never let God in. He never gave himself a chance to bring Jonathan, his son, to God. And he never gave God a chance to be able to say that statement, I'm the God of your father. It's a real shame, actually. But on a brighter note, what could have God have said to Jonathan if he was doing this introduction? Now, he didn't do this introduction, but I'm just thinking hypothetically. What could have God have said to Jonathan in the way of an introduction? Could he have said, I am the God of your friend, David? And I would say yes. Of course he could, because look at David. Look how different he was and look how he embraced God in his life and look at the effect of that. He was a spiritual man who loved God and it showed. And God could say, I'm the God of David. In fact, God did say that. Not to Jonathan, he said it to Solomon and he said it to other people. This statement, I am the God of, in the Bible is reserved to a very select few. We know some of them and David is one of them. Hopefully this is inspirational for you people. Um, I really, I'm not just talking about the fathers, by the way. I'm not talk, talking about, how does God introduce himself? Through people. And I'm not talking about fathers only. I'm talking about the mums. And I'm talking about our brothers and our sisters. I'm talking about our aunties and our uncles. And I'm talking about our friends and our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Just having a look at this diagram now, having um, gone through what we've done, where would you fit on this diagram? Are we in that first circle where we know of God and we know a lot about God and we've heard a lot about God? That's okay, by the way, if you're in that circle. That's great. Because Jacob spent most of his life saying, referring to God as the God of his dad. And if you're in that circle, Think about the very special people that are in your life that are in the central circle, bringing you to a knowledge of God. Think about them and perhaps look around you now and give them eye contact because I know they're sitting right here with you. And you know what? I thank you, PK, for bringing me to a knowledge of God. I know where I fit over here and PK sits right in the middle bringing me to God. How lucky are we to have a smorgasbord of people to come together with a, with a variety of backgrounds and re different relationships with God. And when you tell your stories about God, I'm listening and I'm all the better for it. I now know God so much better because of you. And you know what? God could come and say, I'm the God of PK when he's introducing himself to me. And I would be amazed. I might even put my hands over my face and be fearful. But I know what I will do. I will cry out to God and go, I want to know you personally. And so with this diagram, and again, if you've moved into that central position, if you've moved into that very important position where you've had a relationship with, you have a relationship with God, that's wonderful. And just know that you are giving a lot of information to people and teaching them about God, about who you are and the way you act. I also thought maybe it's worth thinking the transfer from knowing of God to knowing God personally. What does that look like? I'm so stoked that Ron brought up that, that chapter in Acts 22. Saul. So, was the transfer from you knowing of God to knowing God personally was it a big moment like Saul? <laughs> a really big moment. 
or was that transfer from you moving from knowing of God to knowing God personally, was that just a, a string of, of big events or was it a very slow development? You know what, that's okay. As long as we, we are moving in that direction towards God. We know where Jesus fits on this model. And whether we're, in, we're there or in the middle, we move back to here when it comes to Jesus. Jesus is our friend. Jesus is that one that constantly talks to us about God, constantly sharing to us about God, passionately and constantly. And Jesus is the one that also shows us God. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father but by me. Jesus says, I have manifested God's name. So we've been talking about developing that relationship with God and how important that relationship with God is. But in order to form a relationship with God, we need Jesus and we need to form a relationship with Jesus. So it might be worth considering the overlap of circles between you and Jesus in your journey to your relationship with God. Jesus makes God look like someone we really want to get to know. Just to finish, God has changed the way he introduces himself now because of Jesus. And when I say changed, perhaps he's added. He's added a new way. And I'm not saying that what I've just said is out of play. It's still very much in play, and we do bring each other to God. But God says a slightly different thing in the way of his introductions. How does God introduce himself now because of Jesus? God doesn't introduce himself. He just introduces Jesus. And by implication of the statement that I'm about to share with you, God is the Father. But Jesus just God just brings Jesus into a room and says, this is my son. And he says it twice. God says it publicly at his baptism and publicly at the transfiguration so everyone can hear, so all of us can hear God's introduction, his new introduction. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Thanks.